So on April 17th, I went down to FERC to report on the submission of 105,000 signatories on a petition to stop approving oil and gas infrastructure. This uh, signature, signature drive was initiated by Jill Wiener of Castillo Citizens for Safe Energy. When I got there, I passed through security with multiple cameras. I told them I had cameras as I got scanned. I met with the media relations department representative. He allowed me to videotape the proceedings off the TV in the press room. And he also stated that I could do interviews for people not in front of the meeting room, but down in the foyer on the ground level. As a reporter, I was allowed to ask questions on the current agenda after the meeting. So shortly after that, the representatives for Catskill Citizens for Safe Energy left, and Pramila Malik showed up, and I decided to give her an interview at the ground level. Immediately, the guards challenged me, saying no cameras are allowed on the ground level, and I explained that the media relations department allowed, gave me permission to do so, and they said, that's fine, as long as you're pointing the camera outside of the building, which I did so for the interview. Ten minutes into the interview, the guard again approached me and told me that the person they thought that that was in charge of media relations wasn't, and the person who was in charge did not allow cameras, so I had to leave. So here's the interview that I was able to get shortly before I was asked to leave, and of course what counts is, what's your opinion? Okay, your name? Pramila Malik. And uh, why are you here? Um, well, I'm here to represent impacted communities. Um, and present a petition to uh, for commissioners, um, letting them know that the American public are tired of their rubber stamping policies and request meaningful participation and engagement um, in the process. Okay, tell me your personal experience dealing with FERC. Well, um, I'm the founder of a, a group known as Stop the Minising Compressor Station. Um, we engage the FERC process when we receive notices that our new neighbor was going to be a natural gas facility, specifically a 12,260 horsepower gas compressor station. Um, and so we engaged the process faithfully. Um, we read the FERC rules and regulations, and um, we read all of the national as well as state and local environmental laws and um, regulations, and then we articulated our objections within that framework. And we were very, very confident that per FERC's own guidelines and per um, the National Environmental Policy Act, that we are absolutely on solid ground that the project should not be approved in our community. Yet it was improved anyway. And um, we presented to the FERC Commission um, through an abundance of testimony, um, through affidavits, through we submitted all kinds of evidence documenting lies, omissions, misstatements in the um, uh, um, in the reports submitted by the project sponsor. So we were very confident that you know, based on all of those violations. Um, based on all the inaccurate data, um, that the commission would have no choice but to rule in our favor, just based on simple, common sense, long-standing jurisprudence. But yet, we were shocked to find that they approved it anyway, and in fact, had become so frustrated with, with all of the legal arguments that we put forth that they actually, at one point, just shut down the um, the review process, the comment process, and just expedited the approval. Um, so it seemed like they, at, at some point, it seemed like at some point um, somebody, you know, the word came down from above that this project has been delayed long enough and it needs to get approved. And the approvals were just immediately issued. Okay, so explain that shutdown to me because 
as a layman, I don't quite understand the shutdown process. In other words, legal arguments are being presented, mm -hmm. and what would be the standard procedure that they typically have to follow, and what procedure did they follow? Well, I mean, the standard procedure, the com, you know, the law, the National Environmental S uh, Policy Act states that all agencies exercising any kind of discretionary decision making must do everything possible to protect the environment and to protect human health, and therefore one can conclu conclude from that mandate that as long as we're submitting substantive arguments, uh, testimony, and, and uh, reports, that they ought to continue to consider them. But they didn't. In fact, they stonewalled us when we tried to FOIA certain documents. Um, they refused to um, supply us with those documents. These are documents that we needed in order to rebut statements made by the project sponsor. Um, and yet, rather than act as an impartial um, agency making a decision on behalf of everybody in our society, including impacted citizens, um, they did not like, they, they basically issued, made, issued decisions that favored the interest of the, the applicants. Okay, I'm going to play a devil's advocate question, and that is when they did not provide the information from the FOIA request, did they actually give a response saying they're refusing to provide it, or was it delayed? What exactly happened? Um, their response was standard um, confidentiality um, internal deliberations. So that is, a, that is an accepted um, uh, legal argument uh, for agencies that they sometimes use. So for example, internal correspondence would be considered internal deliberations, but correspondence between FERC staff and the project sponsor uh, are not, should not be considered internal deliberations. The landowner list, we requested the landowner list, that should not be considered confidential information. We requested the, the scientific reports and studies and data which they, which they relied upon to refute our reports and our data. They, you know, again, define that as confidential information. Now, you know, there's also... Let me see if I got this straight. The information they used to refute your arguments, when you tried to FOIA it, it they refused to provide. Yeah, uh, under critical energy infrastructure. Could you give me a, a specific example? The landowner list. So, for example, there's a requirement, um, a, a legal requirement, on the, prod of the, on the part of the project sponsor to notify every resident living within a half mile. Um, um, and that basically formally, you know, uh, commences the FERC process. Now, we were able to document early on, this is very early in the process, um, that in fact they did not inform a vast majority of the landowners and the homeowners. In fact, a very small fraction of the actual homeowners received the required notice. Once we were able to get um, numerous affidavits, dozens and dozens of affidavits from, uh, from homeowners within a half mile that they did not receive the required notice, then the project sponsor was required by FERC to begin the process all over again. But once again, even when they redid the notification process, we noticed that the number of landowners that they acknowledged was still still a fraction of the actual number of homeowners and that is because our community had been growing rapidly in the last five to six years. We have a lot of first responders who live in our community and many, many moved to our area after 9-11 to get away from um, the congestion and the pollution of living in an urban area and they were advised by their health care providers to seek a more rural, pristine area. And we already had a good number of first responders, so many more just kind of clustered there. So there was a huge population boom in our community in the last couple of years. And we knew that the landowner list, um, that the numbers that they had were inaccurate. And this is why when they redid the process again, refiled and resubmitted a new number of landowners, we still knew that that number was inaccurate. And therefore, we formally requested the actual list of every landowner so that we could verify who who was and who, who should have been on the list and who wasn't, 
and who was in fact informed. But they defined that as critical energy infrastructure and they did not um, release that information to us. And I, I suspect that the reason they didn't is because they knew they were in violation of the very first requirement of the FERC process and they did not want to have to restart the process all over again. Okay, and were you, uh, you told me earlier you were able to uh, talk with FERC commissioners and mm -hmm. you could, in fact, I think you said numerous times, so why don't you tell me your, your experience talking with the commissioners? Well, we... You could, you could go into... Sure, the sure. So, you know, we are, what, four hours, five hours, a couple of hundred miles away from Washington, D.C. When we realized that this federal agency and this you know, small group of five individuals was going to make a decision that will have bearing upon the rest of our lives. It will have bearing upon our health, our well-being, our financial uh, 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 situation. Uh, it will determine whether we can stay in our homes or not. We said, you know what, we need to go and meet with these people. We need to see them face to face. We need to know who they are. They need to know who we are. They are making a decision that will impact us for the rest of our lives. Um, they are making life and death decisions um, for us. And, and so we felt that we should come down to Washington, D.C. and see who these people are. And so we did exactly that. Um, during our review pro process, uh, a few of us came down at first. Um, and it was a very um, enlightening experience. We kind of learned what the process was like. We got to see the commissioners face to face and we did get to speak to them both before as well as after the the meeting and we were surprised at how open they were, um, especially commissioners Lafleur and Wellinghoff. Um, and so we decided that, you know what, until this decision is, is made, we are going to keep coming back and we are going to keep reminding them that we are human beings. We're not just um, a, you know, a, a dot on a map. This is how they normally look at communities as just a simple dot on a map, a little speck on a pipeline. But we are human beings. We are families. We have children. We have, you know, loved ones. And um, we are parents. We are moms and dads. And we wanted them to know us as that. As we wanted them to put a face to our community. And so we started coming back, and we came back every FERC meeting during our review process. And at one point, we came with half of the town of Minisink. We came with over 80 families. Um, that would have uh, filled up the commissioner's room. It, well, it, it actually it didn't fill it up quite, but you know there were qu quite a few seats left for lobbyists and um, industry personnel. And we found it really interesting that you know there were a bunch of reserve seats for, for, for the lobbyists and the industries and, and they actually got like, you know, the the front right seats. Um, um, so they kind of got a privileged position and, you know, we were a little bit further away, but, but we were able to, you know, attend the meetings. We were not al allowed to speak and I feel that that's highly unfair. Um, we do appreciate participating in the meetings, but I mean, uh, to, uh, observing the meetings but um, given that you know discussions, decisions are being made that impact American people every day, I think that um, stakeholders and landowners ought to have a seat at the table, ought to be able to participate, ought to be able to present information as industry often does. Um, but right now, um, we don't have those rights and those privileges within this process, and it needs to be reformed. Okay. Inside the building. Can't film inside Can't the building. Can't film inside the building. You can film on the corner here, on the sidewalks, wherever you want, but not inside the building. Really, Could you tell me really who was complete, almost completely done? Okay. Could you tell me who made that decision? Yeah, that's our media relations division here within FERC. They made that decision. They're the people that make those Tony decisions. Clark. It was Tony so, Clark. So who, who what was the name of the, the, the media relations person that made that decision? Well I'm not gonna disclose any names, what I'm telling you is that they made the decision. Can you, can you check so, the